Thank you for coming. I must say, I, I do feel it's an honor to be giving an inaugural lecture for something as important as an Institute for Public Policy. I, I do think it's a key area to be working in and thinking about and developing uh, and so many needs in the area. Um, <clears throat> I've got a lot to get through uh, now. I'm going to rush rather, uh, so you'll need to hold on to your seats. Um, I hope I won't skip over too many slides before you've seen what they show. Um, I like to start off, with, I'm, basically what I'm going to do is just give you a glimpse of the effects of inequality on a society. I'm not going to go through all the stuff in our spirit level book which shows how damaging inequality is in a society. Um, and then I'm going to move on to uh, what I think is a sort of um, uh, a kind of social deficit in our societies. I mean, it's clear now, and this will be part of my argument, that to improve the real quality of lives now in our, our society, it's no good raising material standards further amongst the population as a whole. Uh, what we need to do is improve the quality of social relations, the social environment. Um, and then moving on from there uh, to how we integrate any of that, uh, greater equality and dealing with this, what I call a social deficit, uh, how we integrate that with uh, responding to uh, uh, climate change, global warming. I'd like to start off, though, with this slide because it shows how miserable we are. <laughs> um, <coughs> this is a picture taken outside Oxford Street tube station in the centre of London. People going to reasonably jo good jobs. These aren't the poor and unemployed. Um, and everyone looks haggard, <laughs> anxious, grumpy, fed up. And I think it's extraordinary in our society where, you know, we're living at unprecedented levels of, of wealth and luxury. I mean, uh, barring the argument, uh, I, I disagree with the, the Tories about the rise in living standards, uh, but uh, in, in terms of the long historical trends, there's no doubt that we are... Uh, we live in unprecedented uh, comfort and luxury, and yet it doesn't produce the sort of happiness that people might have expected. You know, if you'd been told that even the poorest 20% of the population, most of them have cars and uh, uh, DVDs and central heating and so on. Um, anyway, so there's, a, there's a sort of some kind of, there's something going wrong. Um, this is a graph showing life expectancy in relation to national income per person. You can't read the names of those countries, but uh, what it's showing you is there's a rapid rise in life expectancy in the early stages of economic development. So here are the poor, many of the African countries down here. Then you get to the middle income countries uh, here, and there's Croatia, I see, Malaysia, um, Albania, and Chile here, Portugal, uh, Cyprus, you begin to get the European countries, South Korea, Israel, Spain, France, um, Denmark, Ireland, Norway, USA. So what you get is these rapid rises in life expectancy in the early stages of economic development and then it levels off. We still get rapid rises in life expectancy. Every, two or three, every decade that passes we get another two or three years uh, life expectancy. It's going on as fast as it's, it's the sort of same sort of speed as it's been doing for the last hundreds of ye hundred years. So although that curve levels off, um, we are still getting improvements in life expectancy, but unrelated to economic growth. Um, so even if you're stuck on $30,000 per capita, uh, that curve moves up over time. Um, it's not simply a cross-sectional picture, even if you look at changes over time. This is a paper, uh, the second author there, Angus Deaton, was president of the American Economic Association. And he's saying even if you look at change over long periods, there's precious little relationship between economic growth and changes in life expectancy. Um, but that curve, if we drew instead of life expectancy, if we did it for happiness up the side, or other measures of well-being, you get almost the same pattern. Very rapid rises in the early stages of economic development and then levelling off. 
That is a curve of diminishing returns to economic growth. It is what's transformed our real uh, quality of life, but it's largely done its work. It's important for people in poorer countries down there to have higher material standards because many people haven't got basic necessities. But for us in the rich world, having more and more of everything makes less and less difference. In it, it's no longer driving life expectancy. Um, no longer driving happiness. Um, I think that's a really important starting point to remember this is no longer about, you can no longer in the rich world improve the real quality of our lives simply by uh, economic growth. Um, I'm going to talk about just those rich developed countries. These are the countries that were up on the top right hand part of that earlier curve. Uh, it's exactly the same data but I've just cut off the long tail that would be going down there. Um, so you can see the names of the countries you saw before, Norway and USA, the richest. Um, <coughs> these are the countries we deal with in the spirit level um, because you can get good comparable data for them and uh, uh, they are on that flat part of the curve. Um, and you see, although you all know that life expectancy is worst in the poorest areas of our societies, most British cities have differences in life expectancy between the richest and poorest ar areas of anything from, um, well, five to 15 years within the same city. Huge human rights abuse. It's the biggest human rights abuse in modern societies that you deprive a large section of the population of years of life expectancy. But look, although it's the poorest areas that suffer those things, it doesn't make any difference if we all get richer. You know, Norway and USA, twice as rich as Israel, Greece and Portugal, and it makes no difference at all. It isn't just that there are rather few points here. There's no suggestion of a relationship. Looking at uh, the data within our countries, within our society, uh, I'm <laughs> terrified that somebody's already had enough. <laughs> uh, these are electoral wards in England and Wales, classified by levels of deprivation. And you see the poorest have the lowest life expectancy. It's not a difference between the poor and the rest of society. It's a gradient right across society. Even the people just below the richest do less well than the richest. Um, I, although if any of you have watched uh, in some of the YouTube stuff where I cover this ground, I'm not going to go on, with the same, on the same, down the same track for very much longer. Um, but you see there is a paradox. Income mean, or something like it seems very important within our societies, health ordered by income so accurately here, and yet, income differences between our societies make no difference at all. The implication of that, how you resolve that paradox, is that here we're looking at differences in relative income. It's about social position, social status, where you are in relation to others. That's what now matters in our societies. And I'll be showing you that in a number of forms. Um, as I said, I'm going to argue that uh, it, it no longer makes any difference to raise our overall material standards, uh, but there is a kind of social deficit. And when I talk about inequality, inequality matters because of what it does to the quality of social relations in society. And now that we've been through so much data, we can see that that old intuition, since around since before the French Revolution, that inequality is divisive and socially corrosive. That is profoundly true. Now we can compare the data for different countries, we see that's exactly right. Um, and if you now look at the social determinants of health, you find things like friendship are incredibly important. Or the quality of the, the social environment in early childhood, the quality of family relationships. Um, I mean, there was a meta-analysis of 150 studies of friendship and health that found that whether or not you have friends 
is at least as important, in the study marginally more important, than whether or not you smoke to survival in a follow-up period. Friendship isn't a vague kind of thing, and even when you, they've done experiments making little puncture wounds on the back of the hands of volunteers and watching them heal. Um, if you have a bad relationship with your partner, it heals more slowly. Uh, or you can give people nasal drops with cold viruses in um, and uh, give them also questionnaires about how many friends they've got. And if the ones with fewer friends are about four times as likely to get, to get colds from that same measured exposure to infection. Um, and these are very sophisticated uh, uh, studies, uh, so they're controlling for uh, levels of uh, immunity to cold viruses and so on beforehand. Um, <clears throat> but it's not just health where you see social factors are extraordinarily important now. It's also, you know, the work that economists do on, on happiness. It's social involvement that seems to be the big thing that makes a difference to happiness. Um, you know, again, whether or not people have friends, social integration, uh, invol doing voluntary work, involvement in community life, all those things seem to be amongst the most powerful drivers of happiness. Um, and, you know, what in health we used to call social support, uh, important in, in uh, both health and happiness. And, of course, we all thought that was because, you know, if you've got social support when you're in need or ill or some, something like that, there's somebody who would do a bit of shopping for you. We thought in those sort of material terms. But actually... If you give volunteers, people who volunteer to take part in an experiment, a little bit of money each and you say to them, uh, you randomise them between some, you say, buy something for yourself uh, or buy something for somebody else. You find the ones who've been randomised to buying something for somebody else, um, it makes more difference to their happiness. Um, and similarly with uh, uh, social support and health. It's the people giving the support, not receiving the support, who benefit most. And, it, you know, these, there are extraordinarily illuminating truths that come out of this about the nature and importance of social life, which are crucial. Now we have got, as I said, to the end of what um, raising material standards can do for us. Um, I'm going to talk about inequality for uh, uh, another five or ten minutes. Um, a naive, naive view of inequality that I think most people have is that it only matters if, if inequality creates more poverty or if uh, people think that income differences are terribly unfair. That's the way people imagine inequality works. But there is something much deeper going on. Uh, it brings out features I, of our evolved psychology to do with dominance and subordination. I often say to understand the effects of inequality, you have to understand monkeys more than Marx. It's about dominance hierarchies and a, a deep-seated um, psychology to do with uh, dominance, subordination, superiority and inferiority um, and how that increases status competition and status insecurities and anxieties about self-worth, issues of confidence, self-esteem, all that kind of thing. Uh, all those sorts of problems seem uh, dramatically worsened where you have bigger inequalities, where some people are worth so much and some people, others apparently worth nothing. You know, where do you come? What do people think of you? Are you any good? Uh, you know, and we all become more twitchy about those sorts of things. Um, so, when I talk about inequality, I'm thinking about these kinds of things. Uh, the data we use, just what you can get from World Bank or um, uh, UN Human Development Report, uh, simply the gap between the top and bottom 20% in each country, and you see in the, the, country, the more unequal countries here, look at UK, uh, Portugal, USA, Singapore, the inequality is twice as great as in Japan, Finland, Norway, Sweden, the, the Scandinavian countries. That gap, the top 20% are getting three and a half or four times as much as the bottom 20% in the more equal countries there. And 
uh, sort of eight times as much in the more unequal countries. So there's a big differences between what are apparently fairly similar market democracies. And that's what allows us to see what difference it makes. Uh, what we did was put together an index of problems with a, 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 a range of uh, health and social problems. Actually, they're all problems which have social gradients. We've done a formal test and found actually that the things that get worse with inequality are the things that have social status gradients. Um, so, in a way, we're saying something very, very simple, that problems with that, those social gradients related to social status get worse if you increase the social status differences. Um, and here you see that index with all those components in it in relation to the measure of inequality I've just shown you. The more unequal countries doing worse on all those things. USA, Portugal, UK, the most unequal countries. And down here, Japan, Norway, Sweden, Finland. So those countries are, were not ordered in life expectancy by GNP per capita, but all these things seem to be closely related to income inequality. Uh, I'll show this same, great, this same index in relation to gross national income per head, and you see there's no relationship between the two. The scale of all these problems is related to inequality, but not to GNP per capita. And because we thought that people would be uh, well, we, we knew that the, the right would throw up their arms in horror at the idea that inequality mattered and did, did, any, did any harm to society. We tried to predict the kind of criticisms they'd make of our work, and we thought one of them was, well, they'll say we chose these things not because they're the problems with social gradients where you can get good data from WHO and OECD and so on, but they'd say we'll ch we chose them to suit our argument. And that's not so, but to deal with that, we also looked at the UNICEF Index of Child Well-Being. <clears throat> it's an index made up to measure child well-being in the rich developed countries. It has 40 different components. So whether kids can talk to their parents, what immunization rates are like, uh, how they do in the international maths and literacy tests, all that kind of thing goes into the UNICEF Index of um, uh, child well-being. And here it is in relation to that same measure of inequality. Lower levels of child well-being in the more unequal societies. It's not quite such a tight relationship. It's highly significant statistically. And again, if you look at this measure of child well-being in relation to not uh, income inequality but GNP per capita, there's no relationship again. So although the children's charities talk about child poverty as the problem, they must, we must distinguish between relative poverty and absolute poverty. What matters, you know, because countries this side are twice as rich as those, and you can see it doesn't, we could get twice as rich and it wouldn't necessarily help children at all. Um, what matters is how unequal the societies children are growing up in are and where families with children are in relation to the rest of the population, those kinds of things. Now, we've been through data. This is where I'm going to cut short, not show you the individual data on homicide and imprisonment and social capital and social cohesion and trust and so on. Um, and, uh, but just to tell you, we've looked at all these things because you can get, get download good quality data from international agencies. We never choose the data. We just get what WHO has or for, for these countries. Uh, and they're all uh, uh, significantly related to inequality. I, I, this is just to remind me what I've already told you, that they are all issues which have those social gradients. Now, some of them, some of those issues, for instance, there's not the one in our book, but the, there are some homicide studies that show homicide is 10 times as common in more unequal societies. Uh, in our book, levels of imprisonment and teenage births are 10 times as high in more unequal societies, just amongst that group of countries. Um, you know, imprisoning 
ten times the proportion of the population in those more unequal societies. Um, uh, some the smaller differences, um, things like uh, infant mortality and mental illness, where you find two or threefold differences. So there's still enormous differences in outcomes, how well countries do in these, these things. The differences are so big because it is not just the poor who are being affected. And when I say that it, problems with social gradients get worse when you increase inequality, it might sound a bit obvious. What is not obvious is they don't just get worse amongst the poor. The differences are so large because we are all part of this picture. You know, just as we are, were all part of, you remember those light blue bars I showed you of deprivation levels in, in um, um, electoral wards, a gradient in health right across society, we're all part of the pattern of health inequalities, we are all affected by income inequality. So that, you know, I guess most, of the people, most people here would think of themselves as middle class or becoming middle class or whatever, and, um, you know, if you've got a good education, reasonable good income, good job, you would still be bet do better if you lived in a more equal society on the same income, the same job, the same education. When I say you'd do better, you'd probably live a little bit longer. Your kids would do a bit better at school in terms of these maths and literacy tests. You'd be less likely to become a victim of violence. Um, uh, your kids would be less likely to become long-term drug addicts or to um, become teenage parents. In that sense, we'd all do better. And that isn't saying that you need a higher income to do better. If you were in a more equal society, you'd do better in those terms. Uh, you probably don't want to look at uh, correlation coefficients. Uh, one of the, the disadvantages of... of um, writing a book that is in, uh, attempts to make this picture as accessible as possible and so leaving out all the, the technical stuff is people, critics start to think there isn't any more uh, sophisticated analysis. But there is. Uh, there are hundreds of papers out there. In 2006 we published a, a review of 168 peer-reviewed studies of uh, uh, population health in relation to income inequality in, in different uh, contexts. There are about 50 studies uh, looking at homicide in relation to income inequality. Uh, so some of these things have been studied many times. Uh, we know something about the lag periods. This is quite a nice study where uh, if you get a rise in income inequality, um, the health consequences come through not in the first year or two, but uh, from about year three, uh, and they, they go on accumulating until about 12 years later. Um, <coughs> uh, now, people often say, why is it that uh, while we've been having rises in inequality, health still improves? What happens is with the kind of changes in inequality we've been experiencing, we just get slightly slower improvement in health than we would otherwise. We fall behind in the international league, as it were. Um, it takes really catastrophic uh, increases in inequality to uh, uh, overcome that background, that unexplained background rate of improvement in life expectancy. It's the biggest mystery in public health. Nobody knows really why it's improving. It's not simply medical care. It's lots of conditions that aren't affected by medical care. Um, so during the transition in Russia and Eastern Europe, uh, catastrophic increases in inequality in, in some of those countries and catastrophic falls in life expectancy. But fortunately, we haven't been to those extremes. Uh, people have looked at a uh, number of studies, changes over time. This is from the British Medical Journal, sometimes following the same cohort of people through over time seeing how they're affected by inequality. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I said that um, I've already covered the fact that it, it, it's uh, uh, not just the poor who are affected, so I won't explain these two graphs which just show that. Um, 
Basically, I think what we're dealing with is whether we li live in a society with a very steep social hierarchy like that, or much shallower one like that. Don't think of inequality, income inequality, as something separate from class. Think of the material differences between us as the drivers, the determinants of how steep that social hierarchy is. That bigger material differences create bigger social distances, more of those feelings of superiority and inferiority. And of course, you know, if you're a banker living in a wonderful mansion and eating in places that uh, most of us uh, can't even afford to look at the menu, um, you do regard yourself as superior. And you probably think that uh, you've got what it takes and other people haven't. Uh, you know, you, des you develop a view of it which uh, justifies what you get. Um, I told you to think about it more in terms of monkey dominance hierarchies. You know, in a, uh, an animal dominance hierarchy, the, the strongest, the, the one at the top, tends to be physically the strongest, the chief baboon or whatever and the one at the bottom tends to be the weakest and it's a structure that's held in, uh, you know, it, it, it's who can beat who in a fight, basically. Now, I, I sometimes wish we had measures of bullying amongst adults. Unfortunately, we, we don't uh, openly show our, the ways in which we do bully each other. I, know I was at a lecture last night where uh, someone was showing, Danny Dawling, some of you may know of his work, uh, was, showed that in Oxford they built walls across a couple of streets to separate off the poorer areas from the richer areas. So people from the poor areas wouldn't come and make a nuisance of themselves in the richer areas. But we do actually have measures of bullying amongst kids in relation to inequality. Uh, a more sophisticated measure of inequality than the one we used, but uh, the more unequal societies at this end, <coughs> and kids bully each other more, uh, and I think, um, though we don't have the data, that adults would bully each other more in more unequal societies. You look down on the people below you, and uh, we used to look up to, the, uh, the, you remember, we thought the bankers were brilliant. There's some more really telling indicators this comes from a big study of civil servants. Um, it's, uh, now, is it Whitehall 1 or 2? I think it's uh, the second Whitehall study of uh, 10,000 civil servants um, working in government offices. They're classified by their employment grade. Uh, the men on the red bars, uh, the top grade, the most senior administrators are one, going down to the most junior office workers is grade six, um, and the same with women. Um, now, this is showing fibrinogen levels in blood samples that were taken from them. Fibrinogen is a blood clotting factor. Makes your blood clot faster if you're wounded. Think of the subordinate baboons. They have many more bite marks on them. The, the, the animals they have to be worried about are not the marauding lions. They have to be worried about the, the dominant baboons. Uh, they have to show conciliatory, uh, submissive responses, uh, not be challenging to them, and so on. Uh, the threat, uh, again and again, you see, the main threats are within the species, competition within the species. Uh, and it's really interesting that uh, amongst men and women, you see, uh, the, most, uh, the more junior levels in the hierarchy, their blood will clot faster, almost as if uh, they were fearful that their uh, administrative civil servants were going to bite them. Um, another, oh, why have I got, uh, did I put that slide in, um, no, that's right, yes, I thought it was a repeat of a previous slide. There was a paper in the Proceedings of the Royal Society um, not long ago which showed that... Um, and think about dominance hierarchies. If there is a power structure based on strength, you know, as in our pre-human existence, um, 
you'd be safest with the strongest males. They're the best specimens. Women would prefer uh, to have them as sexual partners. Um, and this shows, uh, what they did with this was take, they took a picture of a man, a young man, and then computer enhanced the sort of, to exaggerate the masculine features. So slightly bigger, squarer jawline and a few things like that. And then they simply showed women in different countries these two pictures and said, which of these two faces do you prefer? And in more unequal societies, you find a preference for the more masculinized face, the strong, the tough guys. Um, so, and I tell you those just to suggest that there may be very fundamental things going on in us in our responses to inequality and hierarchy. We have, of course, as human beings, lived in every kind of society, from the most uh, egalitarian hunting and gathering societies um, to the most uh, uh, awful um, tyrannies. Uh, but we, need, we, we have to play a different social game, use a different social strategy, depending on what kind of environment we're in. You know, are we in a caring, sharing environment? Or are we in a, 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 a society where we can have to fight for what we can get? Um, <coughs> and uh, I think basically uh, inequality shifts the balance between them. We have, uh, we have psychologically endowed, if you like, with psychological strategies for either game. We can be stot snobbish, standoffish, put people down, uh, build ourselves up. But we also know how to be egalitarian with friends and uh, uh, so on. Um, uh, and as I say, I think inequality changes the balance between how much we use one strategy and how much we use the other. Um, <coughs> the big change that came out of uh, research on health inequalities over a period of well, I, I suppose it, uh, modern health inequalities research really picked up in the, from about the end of the 1970s. And we always used to think that, you know, explaining these huge differences in death rates between social classes, we had to find what material exposures accounted for this uh, extra this, that or the other disease. Was it chemicals people were working with? Was it air pollution? Was it damp housing? Uh, you know, we were thinking about in terms of material risk factors. Um, but gradually what's happened is we've seen how powerful uh, the psychosocial factors are. I told you about uh, the studies of um, health in relation to, uh, of, of um, friendship in relation to health. But you see, the main groups of psychosocial risk factors for the drivers of population health in the rich countries are issues to do with social status, um, friendship or weak social connections, and stress in early life, um, the quality of early childhood. And those are important, I think, for... They tell us about the same underlying source of stress, that the, the insecurities you can have for, from a very difficult early childhood uh, are rather like the insecurities that come from low social status feeling you're not valued, that you're looked down on, anxieties, all those kinds of things. And friendship fits into that pattern because if you have friends, you get positive feedback. You feel you're okay, the people who value you. Um, you know, but if you feel they exclude you, you never get invited, included, and people don't sit next to you, you feel that people avoid you, we all suddenly feel those self-doubts come crowding in about maybe I'm boring, unattractive, socially gauche, they think I'm stupid, you know, all those self-doubts. And I think actually levels of inequality intensify all those kinds of issues in, in our societies. Um, so, in a way, the social epidemiology, I think, is telling us that the most important causes of stress in our societies, which may be a, what are really preventing us getting more benefit out of the extraordinary levels of, of comfort and so on I, I started out with, um, 
are these things to do with confidence, self-esteem, and so on? Um, in a series of experiments, laboratory experiments, where people invited into the, mainly students invited into a psychological laboratory, and uh, um, <coughs> uh, in these experiments, they were given stressful tasks to do because psychologists, this comes from when psychologists were uh, first interested in seeing what happened to stress hormones when you gave people stressful things to do. Uh, and there were, I think, 208 studies that they reviewed in this paper, putting the data together in a, um, a, a um, uh, what's it called, a, um, a meta-analysis. And so you're given, you might be asked to write about a nasty experience you'd had, or given mathematical problems to do, uh, or asked to give a little talk to the rest of the group about whatever it was, or be videoed, you know, lots of different, all these experiments use different stressors while they monitored levels of cortisol, usually in saliva, but I think sometimes they took blood samples. And these people doing this meta-analysis of all those studies asked what kind of tasks most reliably push up cortisol, the central stress hormone. They find its tasks that included what they called social evaluative threat. In the paper they say threats to self-esteem or social status where others can negatively judge your performance. That's almost exactly the interpretation of these, this stuff coming out of the social epidemiology that I had given. Fortunately, I, I published that interpretation before this uh, paper came out. But the two fit together, I think, just so extraordinarily uh, uh, well, uh, really telling us what the main sources of stress in our societies are. More recently still, uh, this paper came out in uh, 2012, some psychologists saying that a, a number of forms of mental illness and personality do disorders are, are related to what they call the dominance behavioral system. Part of the brain, they now identified what part of the brain, and it's uh, almost universal amongst mammals, a part of the brain which uh, is uh, devoted primarily to understanding social hierarchy and uh, responding to uh, issues to do with dominance and subordination. You know, it's a really important thing. Um, in terms of, I mean, you can think of throughout evolution, access to scarce resources or reproductive opportunities, uh, position in the social hierarchy really matters. Um, they, these people weren't talking about anything that they saw as changed by the levels of inequality. Um, but we had, and I found this paper because we have uh, been working on uh, evidence that all these social, the social, what psychologists call the social evaluative threat, your worries about how you're seen and judged, are intensified in more unequal societies. Um, I hope I have now, is that the one I want? No. Um, I'm going to just... Yes, this is self-enhancement. Um, you see, if you're more worried about how people judge you, there are two responses. Either you can be overcome with social anxiety, find social contact quite an ordeal, withdraw to protect yourself, you know, you get invited out and you don't know if I can face it tonight. Or, you know, young people, especially teenage girls, just so worried about whether they've got their clothes right to go out and what they look like and so on. And you have to have drink quite a lot before you can feel you can relax with other people and all these worries be um, put in abeyance. So you can become depressed, suffer from those anxieties and, and low self-esteem and so on. Or you can do the opposite. You can become narcissistic. You can talk yourself up. You can go in for a bit of self-aggrandizement, self-advertisement. 
instead of being modest about your abilities and achievements, you rather flaunt them. You find little ways of bringing them into conversation so they know, you know that you got one of the top marks in the exams uh, last term. Uh, or that you had your holiday in this rather expensive place and, um, you know, little things that uh, uh, show where you belong. This is based on um, a study by an international team where they asked people to compare themselves to the average on their country, in their country on a number of outcomes. Um, they were what psychologists call the big five, so various aspects of personality. Um, are you better or worse than the average in your country? And people rate themselves higher in more unequal countries. So that sort of narcissism, self-aggrandizement seems to increase. Um, I skipped over, uh, this is depression that increases in more unequal societies. That's the people going down, overburdened by these things. Um, I, have I got schizophrenia? There's been another study of schizophrenia showing it, it is higher in more unequal societies. This is uh, Jean uh, Twenge's study of um, uh, the rise in narcissism in the United States, uh, which we find seems to mirror the rising inequality in, in society. Um, and it's suggestive that there may be a link between the two. Um, OK, so I've shown you those things just to get an idea, a less naive idea of what inequality does to us, how it gets deeply into our psychology. Uh, I should have, if I'd had time, shown you how in more unequal societies people withdraw from social life, community life is weaker, people trust each other much less. Uh, you know, the damage to social life um, from in that sort of way. Now I just want to... And basically, this is what's happened to income inequality. It came tumbling down from the sort of 1930-ish, went on uh, falling until the late 1970s. This is a number of different countries. It's just the top 1%. And then the modern rise of inequality. Uh, and if the figures went on a bit longer, you'd see that we've got back to levels of inequality not seen since the 1920s. All that progress during the 20th century has been overturned. That seems uh, to be, oh, yeah, I, I'm going to skip that too. That seems to be largely, this is a, a graph showing the proportion of the labor force in trade unions in relation to inequality. These are 16 countries showing uh, each dot is a country at a particular date. So each country has uh, probably several points on there at different dates. Um, but anyway, as um, the proportion of the population in the labor force in trade unions reduced, inequality rose. Now that isn't simply what trade unions do for the wages of their members. I think you should regard this as an indicator of this whole, s the waxing and the waning, if you like, of the strength of the whole countervailing voice in society, of the whole labor movement as a countervailing voice. And of course, um, with the collapse of Eastern Europe and, and so on, uh, Thatcher was able to say there is no alternative. Um, but uh, I do think that uh, U-shaped distribution uh, uh, trend in inequality is a result of first the strengthening and then the weakening of the countervailing voice uh, uh, of Basically, people, organizations concerned with social justice and fighting for it. You know, the left, politically, the left entirely lost its any idea of what it was doing in the 1980s. Um, you see the same sort of thing in, in um, uh, Asia. This is a World Bank report on those, what the, the countries we used to call the Asian tigers, countries like South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong and the Philippines. They all reduced their income differences in a 20-year period um, from about 1960 to 1980. And this World Bank report uh, looks to see why they did it. It has a chapter on why they reduced their income differences. And they say 
in each case they, they faced what they called crisis of legitimacy, meaning that uh, Taiwan faced the claims of mainland China, Hong Kong faced uh, again the claims of China, South Korea faced North Korea. They all had communist rivals um, and reduced income differences in order to gain public support. Uh, we did it in the war to gain cooperation in the war effort, make people feel the burden of war was equally shared. Um, now, um, I, I, this is a bit bitty because I'm trying to get too much in. in. I don't think it's enough to rely on redistribution to reduce inequality. You can do a certain amount that way, but the weakness is that you know, supposing you do get the top tax rate up again, um, it can, well, at the moment, uh, high um, people with high incomes can just uh, use tax havens and various accounting schemes for avoiding tax. Uh, but also, you know, Brown put the top tax rate up to 50%, Cameron took it down again, Miliband has um, said he'd put it up again, but the next government that comes along might put it down again. I think we have to get greater equality more fundamentally built into our societies. Um, countries, about half the members of the European community, have uh, at least some provision, and in some countries it's pretty slight, but are some stronger in others, for employee representation on company boards. The countries with strong um, uh, laws of that kind uh, seem to have uh, smaller rises in income inequality. Um, I think we need to go further than that. We need to support mutuals, friendly societies, employee-owned companies, um, cooperatives, the whole democratic set sector. And instead of, you know, in the FTSE 100 companies, the average pay ratio is around 300 to 1 between the CEO and the most junior uh, full-time worker. There's no more powerful way of telling a whole swathe of the population you're worth almost nothing than to pay you a third of 1% of what somebody else in the same company is getting. But in the Mondragon group of cooperatives, which uh, is about 84,000 employees, the average ratio, I believe, is about uh, one, around 1 to 5 or 1 to 9. Uh, the public sector is uh, usually somewhere between... 1 to 10 and 1 to 15 uh, in this country. Even the police and the army have much smaller uh, pay differences. But there are other advantages to democratizing our economy. That's the, I mean, the, the undemocratic power of multinationals and so on. We just have to face it, deal with it sometime. And we need lots of incentives to um, the, the more democratic kind of companies. Um, and they have other advantages. I think they behave more ethically uh, in environmental and other terms. I haven't yet seen a good study of that. Um, I, uh, they certainly have those smaller pay differences. They also, um, people commenting say they can turn a company from being a piece of property into a community. It changes the experience of work um, if you're not just um, bullied by a bosses to serve the interests of external shareholders, but the boss is actually accountable to the body of employees. Um, <clears throat> so lots of advantages in going down that road. Um, but I do think that basically, you know, we have to combine the changes we need to make to improve the social environment, to reduce inequality with the changes we need to uh, uh, deal with uh, the threat of global warming. We know that uh, uh, temperatures are rising pretty rapidly, uh, ice is melting pretty rapidly, um, uh, sea levels of... I was talking to my daughter, since she is now 30, since she was 10, uh, sea levels have risen about uh, 6 centimetres um, and are rising about 3, three centimetres a year, 3 millimetres a year. Um, so we do have to face this, um, and equality has a major contribution to play, partly because it uh, reduces the status competition 
that feeds consumerism, um, which makes us go on playing this sort of zero-sum game, competing, trying to outdo each other in terms of uh, status goods and so on. Um, <coughs> In, interestingly, people in more unequal societies work longer hours, they get into debt more, they spend more of their income, they save less, because money is even more important. It's how you show what you're worth. Um, and of course, the psychological studies of consumerism show the people who are most into that kind of materialism are the most miserable. It's a very long way from a road to human well-being. You do it to prop yourself up because you're feeling low. Um, and we can liberate ourselves from that and by doing so uh, sol <coughs> remove or reduce one of the greatest obstacles to moving towards sustainability. You know, consumerism is the major obstacle <coughs> in the rich world. Um, uh, yeah, also because social cohesion develops, community life is stronger, in more equal societies, people trust each other more. Um, people are more public spirited. Um, and one of the indications of this is uh, an international study of opinions of business leaders find that business leaders in more equal countries give a higher rating to environmental issues. They think they're more important. I think in more unequal countries, business leaders feel we have to look after ourself, ourselves. That's not for us to worry about. You know, if someone's going to do anything, it has to be government. Um, people in more equal countries also recycle more. So I want to move towards an idea that sustainability is an ugly, uncomfortable exercise where we go on living the same inadequate lives with a bit less of everything. We've got to have lower living standards. That's the common view of what moving towards sustainability means. We've got to make much bigger changes which are about moving towards a higher quality of life where we improve the social environment, where we improve the quality of social relations, the strength of community life, uh, part, and the experience of work through creating a, a bigger democratic sector in the economy um, uh, and reducing all those problems related to inequality, whether it's violence or drug abuse or teenage births or any uh, mental illness or any of the others. So, I've uh, taken all except five minutes. Well, I've got ten minutes before I need go. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I have to answer one or two questions. <laughs> yes. Yes. Now, if we look at universities over the past 20 years, I think you see there's been an escalation of inequality. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wonder about the point to have those who live in glass houses, because we could start, we could start, it's not just them. Yeah, I, I know and, there's... And second follow-up, I think your ideal society, Yugoslavia. It didn't have freedom of speech or. And there are inequalities in other communist countries in the West. <coughs> so what is have those societies gone? The way they. This is a unique answer to this question. Yeah, I'm happy to. <laughs> why does it not work? And why does it not work here? It used to work very well. It, I, all, all my da data is from rich developed market democracies that work very well. Uh, higher quality of life by most measures in the more equal countries. Uh, there's nothing that doesn't work about, this, for instance, the Scandinavian countries. If you want to look at the more unequal of the rich developed market democracies, the United States, it has the highest homicide rates, highest obesity rates, highest proportion in prison, highest mental illness, 
uh, a great raft of things uh, going wrong. And the lowest life expectancy, not well, not quite the lowest life expectancy of the developed world. It comes about in about number 28 or 30. The communist countries imposed, in, uh, imposed greater equality by diktat. And uh, because they were enforcing something on the population, then restricted freedom of speech, and you got into police states and so on. I'm talking about extending democracy as the way of increasing equality. I think the bonus culture reflects a complete lack of any democratic constraint at the top. The people, I mean, this is a graph of the takeoff of uh, income differentials in the 350 biggest American companies, uh, the ratio of CEO pay to the average production worker. You see, <clears throat> around uh, the 80s, the ratio was sort of 1 to 30 or 1 to 40. That huge rise happens uh, in the later 90s and early 2000s. Uh, it, it increases tenfold. That's the lack of any democratic constraint at the people on the top. And we have to deal with it uh, by employee representation and so on. Um, uh, so I would say that the examples of great inequality don't work. Uh, American politics, is, I mean, people like Paul, no, he was, he's, uh, he's talked about, Paul Krugman talked about the research, but he wasn't the person who did the research, showing that the political divide gets worse and worse as income differences uh, increase. Uh, there was a time when America used to be much more equal, and there was a big overlap in voting between Republicans and Democrats. Now there's no overlap at all. And, you know, the pol political system becomes m more and more bankrupt. Uh, I fear us getting into things like that, too. So, you know, I say quite the opposite. I, I don't want to do it the way the communist countries do, by restricting uh, democracy. I want to extend democracy. Uh, well, t Tito was a dictator. Tito was a dictator. Uh, I, another question up there. But I suppose my thinking really is that when you went for the kind of primate example and said that it is a dominant hierarchy and we're all kind of envious of those hierarchies, I kept thinking with human beings it's not kind of the opposite of that, which is the point with human beings is identity and the, the concept of self-worth is pretty important to them, but we're kind of different from apes in the sense that we can create our own dominant hierarchies. And if that pursuit of status, using whatever resources we've got available, which one could argue might well give rise to some of the health and the problems that, that you're focusing on, like you know, drugs, crime, blah, 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 you name it. Because the point is that when, when, when you talked about, you know, I mean, I, 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 I thought you were around civil sort of servant stuff, and blood blood, it was fascinating, but uh, to me, that, that just didn't ring through. It wasn't you know, the, the, the right level of analysis of what human beings can do and the implications for their health and well-being. <coughs> it, it just seems to me that, that we could be a much, a much more flexible species in apes. It's not all about dominance. Because the point about human beings is that they're not very good at signaling dominance in their behavior. You mentioned bullying, but there's a million other behaviors that you can look at. Well, let me. I've only got a minute before I must leave. Um, uh, even in early childhood, it looks as if there are some epigenetic processes around the effects of uh, a difficult early childhood, a different kind of uh, social environment, the kind of uh, care you get from your parents. Uh, and actually, it's not simply that kids with difficult childhoods are damaged. It's that they're prepared for a different world. You know, are you uh, growing up in a world where you must fight for what you can get? learn not to trust others because we're all rivals? Um, or am, am I growing up in a society where uh, I must, uh, where I'll depend on cooperation and empathy, um, uh, on trust? Uh, and that in, requires a quite different cognitive and emotional development. Uh, and it looks as if, and there have been studies now that to show that, for instance, between rich and poor uh, parts of Glasgow, there are epigenetic changes. That means changes in gene expression. So not changes in your genes, but what the genes do to your development. Um, 
uh, affected by social status, the animal studies which where you manipulate social status and see epigenetic changes. So these things do have a deep-seated base. I think we got into it because we come from health and we were looking at the biological effects of chronic stress on the immune system, the cardiovascular system and many other biological processes and learning about dominance hierarchies. Uh, uh, so, for instance, people find that uh, in um, <coughs> studies of uh, macaques in captivity and baboons, you see very many of the same physiological risk factors in relation to social status that we see in civil servants. Uh, and yet in the animals, the ones in captivity, they could be reduced, produced under experimental conditions. So we know they are uh, substantially effects of social status itself. Uh, it doesn't mean we're fixed like that. Uh, if you read Christopher Bohm's new book, Moral Origins, he's perhaps the world expert on hunting and gathering societies. In those societies, there was extraordinary, uh, they were extraordinarily egalitarian. Uh, the tendencies to be domineering and so on held in check by what uh, he calls counter-dominant strategies that, you know, if somebody is uppity and bossy, you ridicule them and tease them. If they're more difficult, uh, you ostracize them or even kill them. Uh, he has uh, um, records. Uh, they're now making electronically searchable records of 200 hunting and gathering societies. Uh, and so we know a lot about how this worked. And he sees it basically, those kind of counter-dominant strategies, as the beginnings of democracy. Um, and our democracy just hasn't been working well enough to keep those forces in check. Okay. I must stop. It's my job, I'm John Diamond. I've been involved in setting up the, the new institute at the university today. It's part of my job to thank Richard for, for his inaugural lecture. Um, as I walked across, I now understand the name given to that feeling in my stomach, um, which to do with stress. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, two quick things before we go. The first is that the Institute will, over the course of the next year, be running a series of public lectures across a range of themes to do with health, education, social work, the changes in the criminal justice system. If you're interested and you want to come, then we'd be delighted to see you. And finally, um, the point that Richard ended on is very much, I think, where the Institute sits, that the argument and the statistics and the analysis to use that phrase, are necessary but not sufficient in order to bring about change at a political level, at a social level, in a public policy level, then we are part of that process of change. We are the human agents who can make that change. And finally, thank you again, Richard, uh, for coming and setting us off on a... There you go. <laughs>